Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, again, thank you for hanging in there on the first day of subnets. Um, we know that we stand between you and drinks this afternoon, so we'll try and make it as exciting and interesting as possible, um, and hopefully give you some food for thought um, today and to further on into the Submarine Networks World Conference. Um, as you can see, um, we think that we've sort of agreed on uh, on a format for open networks, but there are still some lingering questions um, out there in the marketplace, and certainly there's a difference between theory and practice that we all see in different cable systems. So um, with that, I think we have a good cross-section um, of the industry here, and we're gonna try and shed some light, yes, pun intended, on some of those things today that are, that are points that that we all think we want to overcome in our cable system. So today, um, as, a, as a group of presenters, um, we'll start with uh, Bob Hathaway from uh, Vice President for Product Line Management at Siena, uh, Pierre Tremblay, uh, Technical Program Manager at Facebook, Arlene Haliorana, Haliorina, uh, Vice President of Sourcing and International Facilities um, at Globe Telecom, Carl Osborne, um, Assistant Vice President, International Network Development from Tata. And Dr. Chen Zong, uh, Managing Director uh, for APAC um, for TE Subcom. And Tony Frisch, technical, uh, Chief Technical Officer at Xterra. So um, we're gonna try and break this into a few segments and we had a, we had a bit of a discussion earlier on and talked about some of the issues um, and we just kind of opened it up a little bit afterwards um, to, to some of those lingering questions. So uh, we, um, as Alice pointed out a little bit earlier, we think that there is a wet dry scenario that exists in all open cables and so we'll talk to those a little bit. So, with that, I, I really want to open up that first question to the entire panel. And, and if you could just give me your perspectives from every single one of you um, as to what you think about open systems and how it has affected your business uh, going forward. So, Pierre, we'll start with you on this end. Thanks, Tony. Um, I think open cables has, uh, has allowed uh, I guess Facebook to continue providing the service to its users around the world um, uh, or to, to be able to support the growth of uh, capacity demand uh, around the world to serve its users. Uh, the open uh, concept has driven uh, costs lower and uh, this is what allows uh, Facebook to continue to provide greater and greater capacity to its users. And from the Tata Communications perspective, you know, the, the concepts of open, uh, with the cables being open, it allows you to make more choices, to get the best in breed opportunities, and therefore allows providing of the, the best services to customers. So the openness gives greater choice and greater solutions. Tony, pick that up. Yes, I guess from our point, it's uh, provided us with a, a set of interesting technical challenges um, and uh, as Alice alluded, we're still sort of looking to solve some of the details, but uh, I think now it's, it's something that uh, we definitely see as the future for the people for whom it makes sense, and I know we're going to talk about that later. Dr. Zong. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, from, uh, from our perspective, Subcon is a uh, system integrator, a turnkey supplier. Certainly open cable is a, a uh, product that we react to the customer's uh, requirement. To us, the open cable means flexibility and choice. So uh, our customer demands multiple uh, SLTE providers. We respond to that by working with the customers, offer the flexibility so they can work with anyone they entrust with the network, whether in the day one capacity or future upgrades. So it's all about the choice. I'd like to broaden the conversation a little bit. So far we've talked about open cables, which is essentially the disaggregation of the SLTE from the wet plant itself. Um, it's a broader topic. 
you get into segregation uh, with the SLTE, and as has been said earlier, it can be located either in the landing station or disaggregated to a POP or a data center. In addition to that, you've got some terrestrial network in the background that you have to deal with, and quite often all of that equipment comes from different manufacturers and different suppliers. So that implies that you have to have a means to talk to it, so standardized API definitions is one way to get at that. And I think as the industry commoditizes, and I think we've heard that this morning and continue to hear that it is being commoditized, uh, Sienna recently has taken a position where we're commoditizing the transponder to some degree away from the SLTE itself. So we're doing an MSA compliant transponder that we're offering through three of our partners, Lumentum, Neo, and um, Eau Claro, which can be then purchased by any system integrator and put into a network as a white box or put into a system that can be addressed as an SLTE or a terrestrial line system. So that this topic is much broader than cable and uh, terminal equipment. It goes all the way down to how far you wish to disaggregate uh, and push the problem into a system integration context. Arlene? Yeah, from a carrier perspective, which I come from, of course, the concept of uh, open systems is very intriguing. Obviously, the benefit is you have a choice of SLTE, of technology, and the flexibility obviously is there, right? The promise of open systems is that you can upgrade anytime you want, you can have your choos choice of suppliers and all that. Having said that, and which I've expressed previously, commercially and technically, you have to set it up correctly, S especially on the commercial front. I think on the technical technology aspect, that's being done right now uh, quite aggressively by many of the companies present. But on the care side, on the CNMA side, it has to be set up quite correctly. And it is going to become quite a complicated dis discussion, but the first mover will have to face all these challenges, right? Right, so let's, let's take up on that first mover perspective, Arlene, and, and kind of continue with that a little bit, because you know, one of the things that we talked about a little earlier was risk profile. And so Pierre's risk profile may be different from Arlene's in the carrier space, and certainly Carl's uh, in the carrier space, simply because there are different dynamics that go on within each company. So Arlene, do you wanna take a stab at that and then we'll, then we'll bring it back? Go ahead. Uh, okay, um, I'm just talking about, in, and I'm sure Joseph Chan has mentioned it a while ago, it, one challenge is really setting the rules uh, commercially between those members of the consortium in the cable. I'm assuming this is a consortium setup for the sake of discussion, right? Um, so if you set up the CNMA, what are the rules for co-location, right? What are the access rules? And what are the, you know, the sharing of the costs as well? So are you going to give unlimited um, options for all the, the, uh, the owners in the cable system to place as many SLTs as they want in that co-location space? Or are you going to limit everyone to be, you know, equal thing? So theoretically, from my point of view, um, from a CNMA perspective, it becomes a consortium within a consortium at times, especially in the POP and in the cable landing station. And of course, there's the operations, the maintenance, the rules. Who will, who will manage all these things, right? Who will be accountable to each of the owners right. for that? So those are the thoughts that are running through my head. It will become a complicated uh, discussion, but it doesn't mean that it will not be resolved, depending on the cohesiveness of the parties involved. Carl, did you want to add to that? Yes, thank you. So we've, we're talking about the, uh, the benefits of an open system, you know, that you have choice, you can make decisions, you can uh, specify the system to suit your own particular requirements and how it is and how it will work. Now, if you're a, a private company planning to build a submarine cable, you're your own decision maker. So you make your own decisions. A lot of cables, as has been mentioned in some of the presentations, are also built by the consortia world, which is a group of carriers or a group of companies that need to work together to build the cable. And having all the, uh, the benefits of choice, 
um, is a good thing on the one hand, but as some people say, one of the biggest curses in the modern world is too much choice. And in the consortial world, having all the options on how you specify the system, all the options to choose, the consortial world needs to make a consensus on the decision. And uh, the, some of the consortiums may be fairly small with perhaps three or four organizations and getting a decision between three or four companies, not too challenging, but in some of the consortiums, there are a dozen or maybe more parties to that, that project. And getting agreement and decision amongst all of those consortium members with all the range of options and choices can, uh, I can imagine, present some significant challenges. Uh, Pierre, do you want to uh, have a take on that, please, since you're the sort of the newest owner that's, that's in that model um, as we speak? Yeah, I think it's clear that uh, the open system cable concept uh, brings some challenges. Uh, it uh, actually shifts some of the risk, uh, both commercial and technical, from uh, the integrate uh, the supplier, the full turnkey supplier, to uh, to the owners because we've split uh, the procurement of the wet plan and the dry plan. So, no doubt that um, it does create some challenges for the for the owners. I think I'd like also to be reassuring because to me the open cable uh, concept is, uh, has been with us for quite a while and, and that was the upgrade market. Uh, it's just that the upgrade market now is, is happening, um, the, the system is being opened to the upgrade market uh, before uh, any equipment is connected to it. So I think there are some mechanism, existing mechanism uh, uh, you know, that were used to uh, upgrade uh, the systems or to deal with the issues uh, arising from upgrading the system uh, that have been integrated into CNMA. So I think we, we've got the tools, but uh, uh, we just need to, to find a way to uh, use these tools effectively to, uh, uh, to reassure the, uh, the carriers. Uh, Dr. Zong, do you want to pick up on uh, that aspect from a supplier standpoint, please? Sure. Um, I think uh, if you look at the open systems, one of the variable is how do you accept the system? In the traditional way, uh, a, a turnkey supplier designed the web plan, has the SLTE, so the acceptance criteria is pretty straightforward. The challenge of an open system is from a web plan supplier perspective, you only got the web plan. So from the purchaser's perspective, from the uh, ultimate customer's perspective, you want to make sure that the investments that you have on this cable system is capable of supporting the various future um, upgrade suppliers or SLTE vendors. So in that regard, the acceptance criteria is something that uh, really going to be critical to the successfulness of open cable. And I think uh, our colleague from ASN earlier demonstrated very clearly that there's there is the number of critical parameters where we can uh, define the successful acceptance criteria to mitigate the risk uh, from the purchaser's perspective. How close do you see that as, 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 being, as being available? And then, um, go ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. I guess uh, we have done, TE Subcon has done a number of open cable systems with various purchasers. We have been fortunate enough to develop a, a number of um, acceptance criteria through the technical specifications. I think at the same time, the industry is converging uh, through the standards committee. There's numerous discussion that's ongoing. And I think uh, from even from the different supplier perspective, we're coming very close. Um, one example I think I mentioned earlier is the GeoSNR, uh, something that independent of SLTE's performance, that allow the web plan manufacturer uh, to characterize the system and allow the purchasers to have the confidence that the acceptance criteria will be independent of the SLTE's characteristics. I think we're getting there. It may be a little bit more time. Okay. Bob? It was interesting. We had a conversation earlier about what would happen if uh, an individual wanted to disaggregate a wet plan and go out and buy repeaters from one group and cable from another, and there are a couple of providers that are in that model today. I guess from my perspective, your tolerance for commercial and technical risk is bounded by your trust in the system integrator. And if you look at what's been happening in the terrestrial space, um, there's been 
from our, the consumption models that we've been asked to consider by many of our customers have gotten very broad where even in s simple installations, you'll have equipment from multiple vendors that you'll then have to prioritize and, and manage. Uh, there seems to be a retrenchment out of that mode back into something that's a little bit more sensible, and that brings the system integrator back onto the table. So Subcom, others, Xterra, ourselves, provide a very valuable role in this in terms of doing the systems integration, which is a little counter to the widely open discussion that we've been having. Tony, you mentioned a little bit earlier that uh, you were already in that game. So, Jade. So, I'd just like to add one other thing. This, this point about trust, I think, is a, a really good one. Um, speak up, just a Sorry, air, I'd just like to sort of make the point that uh, was made before about trust being a really interesting thing because up until now, pretty much all of the measurements that we've done um, have been done basically using industrial test equipment where you can go and see a calibration certificate um, and be sure that, uh, that the measurement is what you think it is. And that would be true, for example, of the traditional OSNR measurement. But the OSNR wet measurement, I think right now there's no commercial equipment that can measure that. And I think uh, all of the suppliers involved in this are going to have an interesting time validating the way that measurement's done. Although I don't personally think this is going to be an ultimate problem, but I think it, it's going to be one that um, people are going to have some fun with. Okay. Uh, Pierre, back to you. With that, with that lead on, um, we, when we mentioned uh, disaggregation a little bit earlier, we talked about how far down in the plant do you go from that perspective and from someone that may be looking to go to a private model in the near future, uh, build your cable from start to finish using subsets of, of equipment from different vendors? Well, I think that's uh, certainly not, uh, I don't see that happening uh, in, in the short term, as far as Facebook is concerned, I don't think we have any intent. We don't have any intention of uh, procuring the various parts of the of the system independently and, and integrating it ourselves. Uh, we don't believe that this is uh, value. We can uh, we can add value there. We think that uh, this is best left to the experts, and uh, we've got very capable. Uh, suppliers who uh, have the expertise, uh, the experience uh, to, to do that for us. So I think for the moment, I would say the uh, open cable concept is serving us well. Um, and um, that uh, would appear to be the case for the, the foreseeable future, but we never know. In the, I would say that I would turn the question around and say that in 10 years' time, uh, there may be grounds to, um, to go back to a full turnkey turnkey concept. I don't know. We, uh, we just have to see. Well, it, it, let's back up for a second. Turnkey, turnkey fits some opportunities, and turnkey does not fit others. Uh, and, and let's say for specific, for specific examples, if I'm a small Pacific island, like where I'm from, um, I may want a single supplier, or as we call it, one throat to choke. Um, to, to carry out that entire end-to-end -end process for me. There may be other situations where I look to do something a little bit different. Um, so with that take, um, Carl? Yes, I would agree with you for some of those uh, smaller opportunities. You know, all of the, uh, the choice and the options that you get with an open system, you need to have the resource and the experience on the purchaser side to do the evaluation, to do the specification. And in a, in a small you know, as you, example you used, the Pacific Island, they may not have that resource. They may not want to even acquire the resource and let the expert turnkey supplier do all of that activity for them. Very simply outsource it as a one straight contract, one vendor to choke, as you said, and be done with it all and not have to get involved with all of the, uh, the, the, the opportunities of evaluation and specification. Maybe there are some benefits in the open system, but that would be a disadvantage from a resource, a cost, and time and effort perspective. Arlene? Do you want to? Well, my only comment on 
totally doing, totally open on the wet plant, which is what I stated a while ago, from a care perspective for me. Um, and I, I pointed this out a while ago, right? When you buy repeaters separately from the fiber and whatever other elements of the wet plant, once you put it into the water, there's no turning back, right? It becomes very expensive for you to put in um, uh, improvements or fixes in the wet plant after RFS. So I admit I have a tendency to be risk averse with regards to that. So I don't necessarily really think that um, at this point in time, it, people would want to take the risk of doing it that way. They would rather do uh, totally just one supplier or a turnkey with a, or a system integrator, where then they have a respectable warranty. They know that they're experts from these uh, providers. So, you know, I'm, I'm just talking about the fact that if I invest in something, the wet plant is very expensive, right? It's probably one of the most expensive portions of the cable system. So. Yep. Bob? If you follow that thread, then and if you're really in the business of servicing a network provider who wants to have the best cost efficiency, the best service velocity, then the wet plant needs to have an open architecture. The, the, it, the rotums in the water, ostensibly, are the same as a terrestrial rotum. They may operate slow, more slowly, they may have a few different characteristics, but in reality, what you're doing is you're trying to implement a full network function. So under those circumstances, ideally you want fairly standardized APIs. You do want computer-based access to the wet plant in order to give you that kind of velocity. And I'd like to have a couple of my panel members who are wet plant owners have that conversation. Okay. Carl, do you want to jump into that wet, wet plant conversation? <laughs> <laughs> No, if not, we'll move on to the to the next element. Let's uh, let's talk. Did did you want to jump in there? Go ahead, John. I mean, I, I'd like to do the usual thing of agreeing with all the other panel members and say that I think it's kind of natural to sell repeaters and cable together rather than sell them separately. But having said that, we actually have people talking to us about buying repeaters all on their own, and and I think it's going to be a very fascinating thing if this actually happens to see how much work we have to put into providing very detailed documentation, possibly supplying software to help them do the system design and so on. So you know, I, if I've got someone who really wants to do it, I guess we would never close the door. Uh, but it, it's going to be a very interesting conversation, as Bob alluded to. So, yeah. Go ahead, Dr. Song. I just want to add a comment on this, is that from a web plan perspective, you, know, you have certain equipment repeater, branching units, and so on and so forth, um, that typically comes even with the open cable system to have the level of controls or electronics uh, functionality that is provided as part of the you call so-called uh, terminal architecture, right? So these will be there independent of the open, openness of the SLTE. So the SLTE, when you equipped uh, onto a new fiber pair, you will be able to interface with these, it'd be to the standard APIs and what have you, but the monitor, the web plan, the control, the BU switch, and so on and so forth will continue to be there. So it's really a combination of the two, you know, different levels of control. I think I don't necessarily see them to be conflicting with each other. I think um, the, some of the vendors have the capability to even further integrate to this, and I think this is continue to be developed, and uh, I think there's room for further improvement as well. So let's talk a little bit about uh, cost and commoditization. Um, as we've heard throughout the panel, uh, we are starting to move down the cost curve, and I think somebody mentioned it um, earlier this morning in one of the panels, how significant that's been. Um, so, you know, from an owner perspective, there is a point of view, and also, uh, and it's certainly a new owner perspective, because some of the existing owners who have uh, been working off that 25-year model um, may not derive the same benefits um, as new owners. So, let's talk a little bit about the cost curve um, and how that um, has, number one, for 
uh, companies like Facebook been good, um, and for from a uh, operator standpoint been good, but from a supplier standpoint, what does that mean to you um, when it comes to innovation and development? Who wants to start? Not everybody at once. I think this is a business where people just have to keep innovating all the time. Uh, and I guess as a new entrant, it's one of the, the things you have to do is to, to go into the marketplace and say, we're doing something slightly different. Because obviously, if we're doing exactly the same thing as everyone else, um, why try someone new? Um, and I think the, the open system is a good example. It came out from an entrepreneurial operator who wanted to do something different. Um, just to sort of add to Carl's woes, he, he also was suggesting the spectrum sharing that we've talked about, which now gives you a, a whole new dimension um, in terms of how you split up the, the spectrum. And I, I'm sure that if you have a consortium of, of people who have to argue about this, that could be a very interesting discussion. Um, but I think, again, you know, where, wherever there's a problem like that, there's the room for some technical solutions. Um, and, and I think it's now quite clear that there are technical ways of splitting up the spectrum. There are technical ways of attacking some of the issues of having different pieces of equipment on the same cable. And I, and I think those are all good things for the industry. Um, and of course, as, as someone who's involved in the technology, that, that, that's the fun bit. Maybe just add on to this. Uh, oh. Go ahead. Just add on to this uh, from a, a little bit of uh, a perspective that when you look at the cost of the total system, there is the components, you know, transponder, as Bob alluded to, is more of a commoditized product these days. Um, the openness also introduced variables. Um, you will have independent fiber pair owners all wanting to have different SLT providers and so on. So the infrastructure setup cost, uh, some of the O&M costs, as previous uh, discussion has alluded to, all comes in, and how do we sharpen the pencil, provide some kind of uh, synergy, um, yet uh, achieve the openness of the independency of each of the fiber pay owners? That's a challenge. That's a challenge that is introduced by the openness of the cable, uh, but I'm sure as we looking at the various designs, we have better way to manage this. You know, some of the web plan monitoring equipment, for example, not necessarily each individual owner needs to have a unique um, set of equipment, maybe that can be shared. Uh, there are some other ways to look at this to improve the overall cost structure uh, of the open cable systems. Pierre. Yeah, I think I'd like to just to pick on the, the point about uh, cost um, and innovation. Uh, when I think of the consequences of the open network is that uh, has forced the supplier of wet plan to focus on making the wet plan better and more cost effective and I think we we are seeing that now happening in the market there are innovation uh, being brought about uh, on the wet plant on the repeater on the cable we are going to have some very very complex uh, WSS uh, enable BU uh, in, in the water very soon. And I think we, we're benefiting from indirectly from uh, having separated the wet plan from the dry plan. And, and um, it's almost a perfect storm because coherent detection came from the terrestrial market and, and we're benefiting from that as well. So um, it has had unintended consequences, but I think uh, it forced everybody to focus on what they were best at and uh, we are reaping the benefits at the moment. Bob? Yeah, just a couple of comments about cost. I think, in, again, in the, the electronic space, we've been on a brutal cost curve for many, many years now. And what slowly manifests itself with time is, sure, the hardware may be commoditized, but the value that comes out of an integrator, a system integrator, is what he offers the customer in terms of service velocity, variable uh, types of features, things that they can do that they can differentiate their offer in the marketplace. Uh, I've been to a few conferences in the last little while when, when my peers and, and friends from Google, Facebook, and other in the ICP space have openly said that they're taking their eye off the electronics piece of the industry because we seem to be on a trajectory that they're happy with and they're going to focus on the web plan. 
and they're going to push really hard to get the cost down on the wet plant and get the service velocity up. So I think from my perspective, that's a real challenge that needs to be taken on head on. Arlene, Carl, it's been good for both of you from a cost perspective. Yes, so I think uh, we've, uh, the benefits of, of breaking the open system, open cable, have enabled you to, to get the best in class of the, of the wet system and the most cost-effective dry plant, which is the portion that gets changed out regularly. So that's driving down the capital cost of building the cable. But the, the cost, of, cost per bit is a combination of capital and operational costs. Uh, to, to deliver the end-to-end -end, uh, customer services. And uh, what, with, with the developments in the dry plant, and the amount of capacity that can be uh, provided over a fiber pair has been growing and growing and growing. And the, the operational cost of providing the power to some of that equipment is starting to become quite considerable. And we've, a lot of the uh, technology evolutions are all about driving more capacity. And actually, I, I think I made a presentation at the conference last year we don't hear a lot about discussions about power consumption, which is quite a considerable cost of operating a system. And I think that that's an area that can be uh, some increased focus going on, is uh, as power costs go up, trying to be more power efficient to help running, reduce the overall costs of providing services. Arlene? Yeah, when we're talking about costs, um, my view is there are two costs, right? There's the CAPEX, and then there's the OPEX, ongoing OPEX. Now, the, it becomes uh, a discussion now on how you're able to maximize the benefits of an open system. Uh, with this current uh, definition where you just separate the SLTE from the wet plant, how you're able to time and to plan your SLTE upgrades and the technology you employ uh, gets into that picture. And therefore, if you're able to take advantage of opportunities in the market, right, in order to serve your customers earlier, quicker, and uh, with more flexibility, then the cost for you becomes negligible. So there's a way of analyzing your investment, and you're looking at the per unit cost as well, which is where the choice of SLTE comes in. So the wet plant, you can't do anything going forward once you put it in the water. But the choice of SLTE, the flexibility of the timing of your upgrades, can lower down your per unit cost on that. So we mentioned efficiencies, um, certainly both in power, um, electronics, from a vendor perspective. Um, how efficient are we going to become? How much power can we remove from those new things that we develop? Bob? I think generation on generation, when we walk down Moore's curve, um, we take out, we set ourselves targets, and we set ourselves targets of between an order of five or an order of ten in every generation. Unfortunately, as we've discussed in this conference, people want nonlinear uh, dispersion compensation. They want all sorts of other features put back in. So, on balance, the electronics power per generation stays about the same. The functionality goes up, but the power in the rack stays about the same. And I, one of the other uh, experiences I've had in the upgrade market is walking into landing stations where at the, at the time where there was 2.5 gig, there were several rows of equipment to do the capacity that is in half a rack that we ship, we, sh we ship today. The power density in that rack is very high but it's much lower than previous generations. So it's, on balance, that's where you're going in terms of efficiency and cost. Um, happy to have the cable guys talk to their end. Sure. <laughs> Dr. Zong. Um, I think in terms of the uh, product efficiency, we continue to look for ways to lower the cost, um, both from the manufacturing um, process improvement point of view, uh, also from the design point of view. So there are applications where not necessarily you go 10,000, 12,000 kilometers, uh, shorter regional systems, uh, or areas in the ocean where the depth of the deployment is not necessarily as challenging or aggressive as a really, you know, transpac deep trench. So have a differentiation of the product where the costs um, can be optimized in order to address the different market segments is one area that we're really focusing on. Um, 
I think Bob mentioned, for example, the WSS Rodem technology that we have been introduced to the undersea systems. That's another example how you optimize the efficiency. Um, when the Rodent technology is applied, when you have multiple, vend multiple purchasers or multiple OADM functionalities on the same fiber pair, what this product gives is the efficiency of eliminating the gar bands. That's what you don't want it to have, is to waste your channel's usable um, spectrums to a gar band. So with a product such as the WSS Rodem, the gar bands is essentially none and you will be able to improve significantly the utilization of the channel or the spectrum. I think that's just another example. I believe the Tony to come. Yeah. Tony? So um, one thing that's interesting about this is that as far as the wet plant's concerned, you, you have to drive power through it to power the repeaters, and you have a sort of compromise between certain techniques like reducing the cable resistance to reduce the, the total power consumption, which adds cost up front, because you have to add more copper to a cable or you have to add more metal in some way. And the alternative, obviously, is to reduce that, um, save the upfront cost. So it's, I guess it's the usual thing of whether you care about OPEX or CAPEX and which guy is controlling the purse strings. But there are some curious options, and one that we've looked at uh, is actually turning down the power of the repeaters at the beginning of life of the system when you basically hope you haven't had any repairs and aren't going to get any f significant ones for a little while. And by doing that, for example, um, you can operate the system at a lower power, saving the power that Carl's concerned about. But I think a much more significant factor, if you've designed the electronics correctly, is that you'll reduce the aging of the pumps. So you'll potentially produce a system which lasts a very long time. You'll reduce the risk of an electronic failure, although I think actually electronic failures in subsea plant are much rarer than the cable getting cut. But I think that's a possibility. Anyone else on that subject? No? Yeah? OK. We'll move on. Um, we'll talk um, a little bit about, uh, I think we covered most of this, it, it, we'll talk a little bit about standards um, that are out there. Um, we, we addressed a little bit uh, of the ITU standards that are out there, and we heard a little bit earlier from Alice that they're working toward it. Um, I, in, in some circles, they would say that it, those, those standards are going to be leapfrogged um, by the time they get around to them. Um, is that something that you see as We've leapfrogged quite a few things as far as um, we've, we've gone, and I'll back up for a second, we've gone from 10 to 40 to 100 to now looking at 400 in pretty rapid succession. Um, so are we going to be able to keep up? Because now we do have an open system. We're looking at best of breed, so I'll, I'd like your take on understanding that. I'll take a crack at it. Um, <laughs> I think we had a very good overview of where the ITU is today. Um, there's no doubt, and I, I think everyone knows that Sienna proposed a, co a new coherent power budget five-ish years ago that's been accepted in the industry. Now we're looking at, it, at the same sort of creation for an open cable power budget, which I think was described reasonably well. Um, we're also working down the path with the ITU of um, a grouping of specifications that talks to how the wet plant can be formulated and put in the water. To your question about will it be leapfrog, um, in my conversations with some of the customers that are buying open cables today, they have their own means of which they wish to accept that cable. Uh, they insist it's measurable. And as we can see, they're going in the water today and we don't have standards. So it is being leapfrogged to some degree. Will we catch up and find a common language, perhaps, but not for a couple of years at least, I think. And we, we chatted about that a little bit earlier in having, um, having systems being designed by purchasers. Um, and so 
you know, with that as sort of a backdrop from Arlene and from Carl, I mean, if you could talk to that a little bit from, from an owner's perspective. Yes, from an owner's perspective, there's, there's two sides to it, really, you know. If it's an experienced owner, as you said before, they may want to specify the systems themselves to meet their own exacting requirements and uh, acceptance to along, along those lines. But for, for, for less experienced operators or perhaps consortiums where they don't have to make these decisions, then having some industry standards that can be picked up as the benchmark will, uh, will, will make life easier. So I think that there's probably opportunities for both scenarios to work alongside each other, and it's not going to be a case of uh, one, one approach fits all. Well, um, from a care perspective, definitely, we, I'm, I think we really need to have standards because if we specify our own standards for a cable system, um, that sort of limits your choice of SLTE providers on the outset. Unless there is an accepted standard for all SLTE providers, then you then have the power of choice. And I think um, if the ITU can already set the standards, then I think that would pave the way for a lot more development and a lot more um, acceptance on the open cable system set up. Right. Okay, we have about we have a few minutes left, and I I want to ask the panel, and usually we talk about the future um, a little bit, we'll try and get our crystal balls out and figure out where we're going to be a few years from now. Um, so I'll ask each one of the panelists, do you see this as, do you see open networks as evolution, revolution, disruption, or where do you see it going in the next three to five years? Is it something that's going to continue to proliferate? Or do you think that there'll be a, gen, a, a general backtracking? So with that, uh, Pierre, start with you. I think the trend is set for uh, open networks to be around for quite, uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, I think it's, it's probably not for everybody. I think the, the panel has expressed uh, their views on that. Uh, but for the large users of capacity, I think that uh, open networks may well become the standard. Uh, and along with that, we will need to find ways to um, uh, have a, or find ways to measure. We have ways to measure uh, open networks, to qualify them. Uh, but there's, uh, uh, there is a need in the marketplace to, to have a measuring instruments, perhaps, to, to be able to measure GOSNR. So this will be one of the challenges going forward. But I think open networks are here for, for the foreseeable future. I think the, the open networks is definitely going to be, for the majority of cases, the way to go forward. Giving purchasers the flexibility to, to run their own fiber pairs or spectrally share fiber pairs amongst a, a group of owners such that owners have flexibility and control to, to manage their own upgrades in their own way forward will be uh, the majority of situations. So I do think it will be the way forward. Time will tell. You know, we've got a couple of open systems that are very near to coming into service. So we've all seen the upsides of it. If there are any downsides that, that come along, then maybe people will uh, take a step back and reflect. Let's hope that they are a success and there are no issues and concerns that come along. And on the basis that they are successful, I think it will be the way to go forward. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think the history is behind this one because it, in many ways it's very similar to what happened with third party upgrades. Uh, when that first started, um, there were a lot of people who were very dubious about it. And they pointed out all the difficulties, and, and it sort of almost sounds like a rerun of this. So I think that uh, unless there are some major problems, um, this is an industry where, in the end, people usually cooperate pretty well. Uh, I think this is going to be something that just keeps moving forward, and it'll be interesting to see what the next step is. Thanks. Thank you, um, I do believe the open cable is going to be an attractive uh, option. Uh, certainly, there will be customers looking for fully integrated systems, but the virtue of the open cable is the flexibility, the choices that you can have. I think as we uh, start to have more and more open cables in the water, uh, we will be able to perfect the standards of uh, acceptance. Um, in the same time, different SLT providers will look at the commonized standards to be able to have equipment much more compatible with 
the uh, web plan as well. So it's, it's a learning uh, process, and uh, the practice will make perfect. I think uh, people will enjoy the benefit of this flexibility. Open networks are absolutely here to stay. They're going to get a lot bigger, a lot badder. Um, you're going to have to have performance at scale. And, you know, given what we heard today about VR and all of the other technologies that are coming down the pipe, if you don't have a means to control that network, you don't have the APIs, you don't have the software, um, will be crippled under the weight. So it's absolutely going to go and it's going to accelerate. Arlene? I think uh, depending on the first movers, uh, as long as the first movers are able to set up technically and commercially uh, on this open system, that will then encourage more to follow in, those, uh, in, that foot, in their footsteps. So as long as the commercial model is very uh, advantageous to all concerned, as well as the technical setup where everyone can maximize their investments, then I'm sure it will be Well, we have about uh, four minutes left. So what I'd like to do at this point is if there are any questions out in the audience, then we'll take a few questions and then we'll go and have drinks. Please. We have a mic. Thanks, Regina. Yes, sir. Thank you, Faisal Samahi from Salat UAE. I think uh, the question here is in very quick. I think we have uh, one term and two definition. One term as open system and two definition for it. An open system that can be upgraded with the SLTs from different uh, uh, supplier, which is the case all the time, actually, before it was uh, by inserting coupler and uh, cause outage to the system. Recent year, the owners of the cables did, did dictated to have system ready for uh, upgrade from different supplier uh, as SLTE, which is the case nowadays. And the other term here, which is being, uh, let us say, float in the market and uh, is being marketed is about having your own spectrum with your own SLTE. And both of these are, uh, when it is considered in consortia, because in private cables, you do whatever you want to do. But in uh, consortia concept, the other solution which is being marketed by let me say the uh, supplier have your own spectrum with your own SLTE. It is not really a cost saving at all. It might be uh, uh, faster with bit control, not full control, but it's not cost saving. This is my question to Mr. Carr. Do you it, believe huh? in this? Yeah, I think it depends what you consider to be your costs. If um if you're looking at operational costs, if, if you have a terrestrial network with a certain vendor and your SLTE is with a different vendor, then you have a, a management cost. If they're the same vendor, you have the efficiencies of management and that's driving down costs. So it's not necessarily capex cost, it can be operational cost as the benefits. Okay, thank you. Uh, that's how I would look at the, yeah, depending on what you see as cost. Answer your question. So, um, sorry. If anyone has any questions for Alice as could, well, could, she's, could, she's still here. Could, so. I, could I just add one comment to that? Oh, sure. Join us. Sorry. Go could ahead, I just Tom. add one comment to that? I mean, I, I understand the point that you're making that it, in a sense, adding that extra equipment adds cost. And, and there's obviously, uh, from your viewpoint, an administrative issue as well. But we've seen people who have been interested in this example of spectrum sharing. Um, as being an enabler to making um, an overall project work. Because without it, essentially, you have to buy a complete fiber pair. So what this is allowing you to do is effectively market the concept of 
a fraction of a fiber pair. Now, I can see that maybe for a consortium system, that doesn't work, but it certainly works for some of the other projects. Any other questions? No? For Alice as well, she's still here. Still ready to answer those questions? No? I think our time is up. Um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank you all for attending this afternoon. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Graham. Thank you. I'd like to thank all the panelists as well for their participation. Thank you. Thank you.